this uh, Saturday morning if some of you men could help get that set up after services. And Grayson Clark Grubb was born last night. We're all excited about that. I've entitled this message, The Mediator. Now, what do you think of when you think of a mediator? What comes to your mind? When I think of a mediator, I think of a person who seeks to bring two contending parties together to, an, to a mutual agreement. And in order to do so, this mediator negotiates with both parties to make concessions and agree on compromises until both parties can agree. That's what we think of when we think of a mediator. Uh, the example that came to my mind, I'm a baseball fan, and there's what is called the year of arbitration. Everybody has a year of arbitration, and that's when the player thinks he should get $10 million. The management or the owner of the player or of the team thinks he should get $8 million. And so an arbitrator or a mediator meets with both, and they come up with compromises and concessions that they could agree with. Um, the player accepts $9 million, poor fella. And um, he, um, he had to make some concessions to take that $9 million. And the uh, man who thought he was only worth $8 million, he had to make some concession to give him $10 million. A mediator. Christ the mediator is nothing like that. God does not negotiate with sinners. God does not compromise. God does not make concessions. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ, Jesus. Now through this mediator, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, the man Christ Jesus, through him, a holy God and sinful men are brought together. Through him, God can embrace somebody like me or you without compromising his character and without lowering his requirements. There's no concessions on God's part. There's no compromise. The mediator has made the way for God to be just. And justify the ungodly. I hope that never becomes dull to us. I hope that never becomes, well, I've got that down. I hope we never lose being amazed by the gospel, what our mediator can do for us. Now, there is so much in this one verse of scripture, so much packed in. I pray the Lord will be merciful and allow us to see what it says. Now, notice Verse 15 begins, and for this cause, for this cause, he's the mediator of the new covenant. Now, what is the cause that he's speaking of? Well, let's back up to verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 9. But Christ being come an high priest of good things to come. Now, I wish I could say everything that ought to be said about that, but oh, the good things to come. Being sinless. Being perfectly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Beholding his face in righteousness. Being in heaven and 
Everything from now till then is working together for my good. So those are good things to come. Everything. Now he's the high priest of good things to come. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. That is to say not of this building. Now Christ the high priest doesn't perform his office in a physical tabernacle that men have made. Like the tabernacle that God described that they were to make exactly as he said in the wilderness. He's in heaven itself and he is the tabernacle. The word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. I love to think of this. Jesus Christ is the tabernacle. He's the priest. He's the altar. He's the sacrifice. The word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. Verse 12, it says, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, Every Levitical priest would offer what? The blood of bulls and goats. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But he presents to God the Father as the priest his own blood. He died. He's presenting the blood of his death as the living Christ presenting it before God. And listen to what his blood accomplished. Look what verse 12 says. Having obtained eternal redemption for us, for everybody he died for. He obtained eternal redemption. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of flesh. Now this is what they do symbolically. They don't sanctify. They don't purify the flesh flesh in and of themselves, but it's a symbol, it's a type, it's a picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ did by his death. Verse 14. Now, if those things did this symbolically, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, As you can, as the Lord enables us, picture that happening in your mind. I know there's a sense in which we can't see figures, but to think of Jesus Christ coming into the presence of God with his own blood and offering himself without spot, without blemish to God. Now, what does he say with regard to all this? And I hope you and I can learn to do this. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now turn across the return the page to Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 17. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Don't try to bring one. Under any condition, don't try to bring something as an offering for your sin. Making up for your sin. Purge your conscience from dead works. Dead works are anything that have my flesh in it. Don't try to bring that as an offering for sin. The offering has already been made, accepted, complete. And to bring something else is an insult to God. Purge your conscience from dead works. Everything that has your flesh in it. You look to Christ only as the reason for the remission of your sins. Back to verse 15. And for this cause, because of what he accomplished as our great high priest, as our mediator, for this cause, he is the mediator of the new Testament. Now, turn to Hebrews chapter 8. Let's see what we can learn about the New Testament. You'll notice in this verse, 
we read both of the New Testament and the First Testament. Look in verse 15 before we go to Hebrews chapter 8. Look at verse 15 again. For this cause he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. So we read of a New Testament and we read of the First Testament. Now look in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now hath he, the Lord Jesus Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator, there's the word again, of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. What promises is better? God saying to you, I promise you salvation if you fill in the blank. Or if God says, I promise you salvation because my son did all that's required for you. What's better? What's better? Verse 7, for the first covenant. Remember he was talking about the first testament, the first covenant. That's talking about salvation by works. It was made first with Adam in the garden. If you refrain from eating this, well, actually, he didn't say that. He said, in the day you eat there, you will die. Now, if he hadn't have eaten, he wouldn't die. But God said, in the day you do eat thereof, you will die. His death was caused by his disobedience. His, his standing before God was in something he did rather than what Christ did. And the covenant of works, it goes on. It's, it's the Ten Commandments. It's any aspect of salvation dependent upon something you do. If it's in any way dependent upon something you do, it's works. Now look what he says. For if that, verse 7, for if that first covenant had been faultless. Now why was it faulty? It couldn't save. It couldn't save. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, and this is God finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. Now, I can take a child by the hand and lead them anywhere I want to. They may be unwilling, they may be angry, they may not want this to take place, but I can lead them any way I want to. Somebody says, well, they won't do it. I can make them. I can make them. God took Israel by the hand, and he led them out of Egypt. God's able to do that. But you know what? All he had was their hand. Their heart was no different, just as bad. And God says, they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their heart. That's talking about the new birth. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me. In this new covenant, everybody's going to know God. I mean, they're going to know him. I don't mean know about him. I mean, they're going to know him. They're going to know who he is. They're going to recognize when he's not being preached because they know him. All shall know me from the least to the greatest. And here's why. For I will be merciful. I will be merciful. I will be propitious to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. I don't know of anything more thrilling to me than to think of me being in heaven and me not remembering my sins. I can't even imagine that. God not remembering my sins. And the reason he doesn't remember my sins is because there is nothing there to remember. That's how powerful the blood of Christ is. It made him not to be. That's the gospel of the New Testament. Okay, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let's go back to verse 15 of our text, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15.
And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death. This is talking about the cross. This is talking about him being nailed to a cross, dying. Why did he die? Because the sins of his people became his. God transferred them to him. When he drunk that cup in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was drinking my sins and taking them into his own body on the tree. That is why he died. And by means of death, for the redemption, the, that's a, the sin payment, the ransom of the transgressions that were under the first testament. Now there we have this first testament, and I thought of the transgressions in the first testament. The first thing I thought of was Adam eating the fruit, dying, and all of us dying in him. Now you'll find it interesting, when Eve ate the fruit, nothing happened. Why? Because Adam was the representative. When Adam ate the fruit, he died, I died, you died. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ put all that away. Now you think about my sins. My sins, my individual sins. And let's just... Let's just go with the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Failure. Thou shalt not make any idols. I'm not quoting the whole um, verse, but, but wrong conceptions of God. Failure. Failure. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Failure. Every time I take his name, there's a certain irreverence that, that is evil because me doing it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Failure. Thou shalt honor thy mother and thy father. Thou shalt honor all authority. Failure. Thou shalt not kill. Failure. Well, I've never killed anybody. Yeah, you have. You've murdered the character. Failure. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Failure. Thou shalt not steal. Failure. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Failure. Thou shalt not covet. Failure. Now, those are the, re the transgressions that were under the first testament. You know what Christ did? By his redeeming death, he made all of them to be removed, gone, not to be, so that God doesn't remember them because there's nothing there. He put them away. Now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin. It's gone. He said, for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of his death, the bloody cross, for the redemption, the sin payment, the ransom of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, his death was a redemption. It was a redeeming death. Listen to this scripture, Romans 3, 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, the ransom payment. The Lord said I, he gave his life a ransom for many. His death redeemed. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, everybody he died for is redeemed. Everybody he died for is redeemed. His, he didn't make an attempt at redemption. He didn't offer redemption. He redeemed. He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. He redeemed. Now, who did he do this for? Very important question. Who did he do this for? Look what it says. They which are called. 
they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Who did he redeem? They which are called. Now I've heard preachers speak, and I have spoken, of a general call and an effectual call. You've probably heard that before. A general call and an effectual call. And the way preachers present the general call, God invites everyone to be saved. He offers salvation to everyone. It's a sincere offer and invitation on his part to all men without exception. Is that in the Bible? Now, all men are commanded to believe. All men are commanded to repent. All men are commanded to come to Christ. You know, the scripture says God commands all men everywhere to repent. So yes, um, in that sense, it's in the Bible. But to say that God is offering salvation to people, but he's only saving the elect... That just sounds wrong, doesn't it? It doesn't even sound sincere. I'm offering you salvation, but I'm not going to save you. Uh, no, I, I don't believe that that's what the Scripture teaches with regard to the call. Um, there is a call for, there's a command for everyone to believe and repent, but it's not an invitation the way men uh, make it out to be. Would you turn with me for a moment to the book of Esther? Now, there's a, the effectual call is... It's, um, it's when God calls and you hear because he gives you life and draws you to himself. Now, let me give you some background. This Esther is right before Job. And I think that this gives us some um, uh, understanding of what this call is. Let me give you the background of what was going on here. King Ahasuerus. This was while the, the Jews were in Babylon. There was a king called King Ahasuerus, and he just decided to have a party. And he was, had all of his buddies out, and he had a really beautiful wife, and he wanted to bring her out and parade her before everybody and show her off, and she wouldn't do it. She refused. I don't blame her. She refused. I'm not going to have a party of this. So uh, the king's buddy said, you need to do something about this, because if you let her get by with this, our wives are going to do the same thing to us, and we're going to be despised, and the women are going to start controlling everything. And so we're good, we need to get this stopped. And so you need to get rid of your wife. And he did. He got rid of her, and um, he started getting lonely. And so they said, um, let's have a beauty pageant, and let's find the most beautiful person in all the land, and she can be your wife. And so they had the beauty pageant, and a man by the name of Mordecai had his niece, Esther. That's where the book of Esther comes from. She comes in, and the king falls in love with her. He, 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 he was just totally in love with this woman. He didn't know she was a Jew. But she was now his queen. But he didn't know she was a Jew. Now, in the meantime, her uncle, Mordecai, Mordecai, was a Jew, and there was a, ban a man by the name of Haman that Ohasuerus had uh, promoted, and Mordecai, when ha Ohasuerus would come, I mean, when uh, Mor uh, Haman would come by, Mordecai wouldn't bow down. And it infuriated Haman. And he thought, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get this man taken care of. I'm going to make, I'm going to get to the king. I'm going to tell the king, look, the Jews are a problem in our province. They're causing problems. They're a bad people. They're, they're, they're going to be nothing but trouble. And here's what you need to do. You need to kill all the Jews. Exterminate them. And the king said, okay, we'll do that. He actually gave a date for all the Jews to be destroyed. Well, Mordecai hears about this. And he comes to Esther. And he says, Esther, you've got to go to the king and do something for us. We're in trouble if you don't do it. Now look in Esther chapter 4. Now, this is after Mordecai has given Esther these words. And Esther spake 
unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. And this is what Esther says. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called. Who is not called. There is one law of his to put him to death. Except the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. Now, this story is given to teach us something of the gospel. Do you think you can just waltz into God's presence without being called? No, you can't. Not who you are and who I am in and of ourselves. There's only one person, if they come into God's presence, into the king's presence, that will find mercy if they haven't been called. The one the king puts out the golden scepter to. Now she says, but I've not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai, Esther's words, then Mordecai commanded to answer, Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdeth thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther bade, him return, bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded and it came to pass on the third day. What's the significance of that? Esther is a type of Christ. It came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house And it was so when the king saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be given thee to the half of the kingdom. Now that's our Redeemer coming into God's presence on our behalf. And that's his answer to his son. And that's how every believer can now come into his presence. Now, let's think about this thing of being called. He says it's the called that receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Let me give you these scriptures. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called. Them who are the called, according to his Purpose. Romans 8 30, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Romans 9 11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to lecture might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks. When Peter was preaching on Pentecost, that great message where 3,000 people were brought, savingly brought to Christ, he made this statement at the end of his message, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Listen to this scripture. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. He's king of kings and Lord of lords. And they that are with him are called, called, chosen, and faithful. It's the called that are going to receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So the question that comes to my mind, and I'm sure it comes to your mind too, how can I know if I've been called? I want to know, don't you? Have I been called? Has God 
called me? Am I just going through religious motions trying to fool myself? Or has God called me? 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. We preach Christ crucified. And to the Jews a stumbling block. They hear the gospel and they say, well, that's an excuse for sin. To the Greeks, foolishness. How's that going to help me? How's that going to improve the economy? How's that going to help our nation? That's foolishness. But unto them which are called. Both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God. And Christ, the wisdom of God. Now let me tell you this. If you see Christ as the very power of God to save someone as sinful and weak as you. If you see Christ as the wisdom of God, how God in his wisdom made a way to be just and justify the ungodly. You see Christ as the power of God to put away your sins. Christ is the power of God to make you acceptable on judgment day. Christ is the wisdom of God. How God did all this. You know what? God's called you. He's calling you. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. First Corinthians 1, verse 2. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now, you know what those who are called to be saints do? They call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the call do. They call, Lord, save me. Have you ever asked the Lord to save you? Somebody says, I'm afraid I'm not saved. Have you ever asked him to save you? Asking you shall receive. The called call. That's what they do. They call. Calling on the name of the Lord, it doesn't simply mean uh, audibly articulating his name. You know the person behind the name. You call upon his holiness to save you. You call upon his power to save you. You ask his sovereign will. Save me as an act of your will. Will my salvation. Save me by your grace. Save me by your mercy. Save me by your wisdom. You're calling upon all of his attributes to save you. You call upon the name of the Lord. There's one reason. He's calling you. And he, this is the effectual call. He never calls in vain. Everybody he calls, he saves. Now somebody may be thinking, well, I've asked uh, him to save me and he hadn't done it. Maybe, maybe I'm somebody who wants mercy, but he says, no, you don't get any mercy because you're not called. That's never happened. That's never happened. Anybody who seeks his mercy does so because he's called them. Thank God for his call. Now, in closing, let's look at what we're called to do in Hebrews 9. For this cause, because of what he's done in verse 15, he is the mediator of the New Testament that my, by means of death, speaking of his bloody cross, and here's why he died for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now let's consider... Inheritance. What is an inheritance? It's not something you earn. How many people have you known that were relatively, humanly speaking, worthless people that received a huge inheritance? 
I mean, they didn't get it because they deserved it. And you think, if I was his mom or dad, I probably would have cut him out of the will. You know, I mean, but they didn't. And now all of a sudden these people have tons of money. And they have it for one reason. Because of their connection with the one who died. No other reason. The inheritance. Because of the death of Christ, the called are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. All that Christ is an heir of, they are an heir of. Now I want you to think about your inheritance right now. You know, you may be having a hard time, but it's a light affliction, isn't it? And it's not going to last very long. You're going to enter into the joy of your Lord. And not very long. Not very long. And notice he calls it an eternal inheritance. And I love the way the Bible always uses this word eternal. You see, God is the eternal God, and everything he does is eternal. This inheritance never had a beginning point. And this inheritance will never have an ending point. It's an eternal inheritance. And don't miss the word promise. The promise. God's promise. Now I can make a promise. And I hope I'm going to be good to my word. But I can make a promise and I don't foresee what's going to take place. And it could be that I'm not able to keep that promise. Now we all ought to keep our promises. Be good to our word. But we're weak, sinful men and women. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I might be dead. might not be able to perform the promise. But this is God's promise. If the inheritance were the law... Galatians 3.18, if the inheritance were given you according to your merit, the law, it would no more be a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. God's promise. All the promises of God in him are yea and amen. And what are the called to do? They were to call might receive. Receive promise of eternal inheritance they receive now have you received what I've just preached as good news have you received it you know why because it was given to you that's why if you don't receive it it was never given if you receive it God himself has given this to you. And this is equally true. Whatever you receive, you're going to ask for. If you're forgiven of your sins, it's not because you asked for it. It's because Christ died for your sins. But you know what you're going to do? You're going to ask for it. He that asketh, Receiveth. Whatever we ask for, by His grace, we receive. And it's because it's already been given. I know that religion makes um, the act of reception the act of salvation. God wants to save both men. One accepts the gift, the other rejects the gift. So it was the difference in the salvation was in, in the acceptance over the rejection. That's, that's just salvation by works is all that is. Uh, it's not your receiving that saves you. If he gives, though, you will receive. Now, one last scripture, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. What does it mean to receive Christ? What's it mean? I want to know. I, I, I want to, whatever that act is, I'd like to do it right now, wouldn't you? John chapter 1, verse 11. He came unto his own, speaking of the Jews, 
His own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. Now you want to know what it is to receive Jesus Christ, the Lord? It's to believe on his name. You believe he is who he says he is in his word. You believe he did what he said he did in his word. And you trust him to save you. You don't have anything else. You don't have a plan B. You don't have any other thing you're looking toward. You're looking to this one thing. You're trusting him because of who he is and what he did. You're trusting him to save you. You know what that is? That is to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. I've received him who is the mediator of the New Testament. He brings me to God as my mediator. He, I love his name, Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. What a mediator. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for our mediator that brings us through his death into your very presence and makes us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in your sight. Lord, we stand amazed that you provided your son to be our mediator, to save us by what he did. We give thanks. We ask that you'd bless this message to our understanding for your glory. In Christ's name we pray.